welcome to us if you're new, uh, and we invite you all to turn to the beginning of the bulletin for worship today. Uh, and we're glad to celebrate our, uh, our Celtic heritage uh, with some music uh, from our guest musician. Thank you very, very much for being here. It's such a treat to have you. Uh, and we begin on the middle of page uh, one on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to our hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be an, in it an infant that lives but a few days. <clears throat> or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from the believers who are living in idleness, and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. 
and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day, so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? He said, beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and that the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first. But the end will not follow immediately. And he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs... They will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. They will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. Will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Before we get real serious, I want to give you an update on our puppies. For those who don't know it, um, my wife and I are raising puppies, laps, and uh, the second litter is four black and two, two blonde and uh, four girls and boys and they're doing great. Uh, they're walking and talking, sometimes louder than we want them to, uh, but they're seeing and they're hearing and they're just wonderful. And they are a rejoicing of God's creation. A rejoicing of God's creation. So, in the spirit of rejoicing, let's enter into where we are as a, as a parish family. Where our nation is. Where God is. Where faith is. Let me remind you about something that I'm sure you're familiar with, and that is that uh, we Episcopalians are what's called creedal and not doctrinal. That means that, uh, that we focus on the creeds, the specific creeds, not seen in apostles. We focus on the traditions of the church, not so much on being very specific in doctrine about how we believe this or that part of the creed. We're not doctrinal in that way. We must believe this. But we take very seriously that framework of creeds and scripture. And, and it really, within that strong structure and framework, there is a freedom for each one of us as individuals to say, well, well, this is what I think. I looked at it very carefully, and this is what I think, and this is what I believe. And sometimes we even change our minds. And uh, that's our approach. That's our approach to the faith. Well, you're familiar with the baptismal covenant. You said it last. You said it last week at the baptism. And in a way, the baptismal covenant is sort of a creed, not really a creed, but it is a guideline. It's sort of a rule of life, um, shaped in the form of questions, not statements, questions, which demand an answer, an answer from us as faithful Christians after we take everything into consideration community in which we worship, um, scripture and our background and our ability to learn and grow 
one stretch. Um, so I would like to I would like to ask you some of these questions, which I've amended slightly today. And you know what the response is, I will with God's help. Which designates, it indicates that this is an individual promise to do this with God's help, said in the context of this community, of this worshiping community. So are you game? Good. Will you, as an American citizen, and a faithful Christian, seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself. I will with God's help. Will you, as an American citizen and a faithful Christian, strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will with God's help. Will you, as an American citizen and a faithful Christian, work for healing in our nation? I will. will God. So, do any of you have answers to those questions right now? They're tough, aren't they? They're deep. They're complicated. But there they are. And you said, I will with God's help. Of course, I added that, la that last one because of where we are as a nation. The heart of our nation is broken. The heart of our nation is broken right down the middle. I just, I can't believe it. I didn't really see that. I don't think many, many of us saw it. Our heart, the heart of our nation is broken probably because the hearts of so many Americans are broken, have been broken, are broken, were broken. And again, maybe, maybe we didn't see that. Maybe we've turned a blind eye to the brokenness that does exist in our community. And for some of us, our hearts are broken because our dreams of America were shattered on Election Day. For some of us, our hearts are broken because we feel left behind and forgotten by our country. For some of us, our hearts are broken because as hard as we try, we cannot put food on the table. We cannot make a living. We cannot provide for our families. For some of us, our hearts are broken because our retirement funds are being depleted and we don't know what's gonna happen after the money's gone. For some of us, our hearts are broken because we feel rejected by the nation we love. For some of us, our hearts are broken because we cannot find safety and security in this nation. Lots of different reasons for lots of different people. But it, it, it does point out, I think, that a lot of people are living in fear and brokenness. Right now, it's probably reached ahead right now. Um, we know that our nation is not going to fail or anything like that. But there is a brokenness deep in the heart of us American citizens and faithful Christians. Well, here's the good news. Hearts broken apart, hearts that are shattered, can lead to death or depression, right? Heart attack. But hearts broken open, not shattered, broken open, actually provide more room for God to move in. And even for the people who care for us to move into that space. And that's what the good news is. If only we could see the benefit, the benefit of the brokenness we feel in this country and among Christians, see the benefit which God offers to us at this critical time, who knows what might happen? Because we know that throughout our journey, communal and individual, God is with us. Jesus is walking with us. About 15 years ago, I went on a sabbatical for um, the, the specific purpose to get more in contact with God's creation, 
and with the people who were in a speci specific part of God's creation, people who resided in that part. So what I did is I spent, I spent two weeks um, in the city, in an urban, I mean, New York City, and then I reflected on two weeks. I spent two weeks in a desert on the Navajo reservation in the Four Corners area, and came back and reflected on that. I spent two weeks on a river, the Potomac, and other learning about kayaking and getting into that, and reflected on that. And then I spent two weeks on a mountain. My son was a worker and a mountain climber in Peru, and I went down to, to Peru and went to Machu Picchu, a very sacred place. And what I had done in every place that I went during that sabbatical on my daily prayers in the morning, I'd sit down on the ground, on the earth, and feel that dirt and make a circle around me with my finger. So it's like that sort of setting off that sacred space. And to, to be open, the, the prayers weren't specific words, it was more an openness, trying to provide an openness for God to come into my life. And, and one day, that day, that single day that I was on Machu Picchu, I was there on the mountain, there were tourists walking around and Peruvians. But I was off to the side a little bit, it was a private space. And I looked for a rock, every place I went, I found a rock. I've got a big bucket of rocks that I brought home for those, for those four miles. But I, I found this rock about the size of my fist, I picked it up. And it was interesting because it had a crack in it. I mean, it was a solid rock, it felt like it, but it had a crack in it. And as I held it, as I held it, I moved my hands a little bit and it, and it cracked open. I mean, the crack went all the way through, but it, it didn't appear like that. And as soon as, it, as soon as it just separated, I said, I mean, to myself, it just sort of came to me, rock cracked open. And it's sort of a weird thing. It's like the name of a Native American or something. I mean, rock cracked open. What's your name? Rock cracked open. But I said it several times, and you know what? It really touched my heart. It was really sort of a, it was a mystical, spiritual moment for me. Because in some ways, I really did feel God closer. I really did feel closer to that earth. I really did feel closer to the tourists and Peruvians for walk, walking around. There was something about that breaking apart, but it wasn't shattered. It was just breaking, and there was space there in between. That was a learning for me. And, you know, it's really nothing new because throughout the tradition of our faith, throughout the tradition of humanity, that's what we know happens, is that if, if we encounter, when we encounter challenge and conflict to a deep degree that really gets our attention, often we feel the misery of that. And there's something inside that sort of has to give. And if our heart cracks open, God does step in to bring healing in the form of the presence of Jesus, the healing spirit, the healing presence of the Creator. And then we are empowered to re-engage with the community, with the people around us, feeling fuller, more connected to the God in whom we believe, and maybe more ready to, to make a change that that community needs. We heard this in the Isaiah reading. People of Israel were not happy. Their hearts were broken. They had been taken into exile. They were not in their home. And yet God said to them, I'm going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And you're coming back to Jerusalem, a joy. In the second reading, when Paul is speaking to the, to the church in Thess Thessalonica, um, things weren't going well. You know, people weren't behaving. I mean, they weren't caring. To, you know, people, if you were a leader of that church, you know, you'd be worried because people weren't carrying their load. And, and yet, and yet, the message ultimately was, uh, do not be weary about doing the right thing. And, and, and what's, what's a piece of that message is, I'm with you. God is saying, I am with you. Jesus is with them. And then, what about that gospel? Such a scary, scary gospel after all that we've been through this week, this past week. Nation against nation. 
Father against Son, put to death, hard, hard language. I mean, for those early believers in Jesus Christ to hear that message in those early formations of a community that would come to be church, you know their hearts were broken. Uh, you know, wait a minute, I'm not up for that kind of conflict. Don't tell me that, God. And yet, and yet, the message was, through your perseverance, your souls will be healed. Today we are remembering, as Ken said, a, an heritage, a heritage of our faith, that is the Celtic Church, which was basically the 6th and 7th centuries in Britain. And, and in these strong, these strong hymns we sing, these long and strong hymns we sing. <laughs> I know, it was a long hymn, but I love it. Don't you love it? I mean, it's all about being committed. It's all about being committed. And the thing about Celtic Christianity is they really believed in the relationship of God, in the Trinity. I mean, they talk a lot about the Trinity. The Trinity. Not just Jesus, but the Trinity. And that is the relationships within God and the relationships with each other. The, the Celtic monks during those two centuries the way, that they, the, the way that they functioned as evangelists is that they didn't go out and say, let me teach you how to do this and that and then, and then you can be baptized and you can be a Christian. Instead, they focused on relationships with the pagans. They went out in the, in the mountains around and just learned their language and learned how to communicate with them and invited them into the community. It was a relational thing. And then the third thing that the Celtics did was they always found God in nature. And, and that's in this music as well. So those are some things that we can think about during our time of challenge and conflict. That's another thing that we can do. Um, I've been talking about a book that I'm rereading. It's by Parker Palmer. He's a Quaker. He's a thinker. He's a person of faith. And he wrote a book in 2011 called um, Healing the Heart of Democracy. Healing the Heart of Democracy. I want you to get that book and read it. It was written in before the 2012 election, but boy, does it ever apply to us right now because we're looking for ways. All of us should be looking for ways to heal our democracy. He talks about the strength of democracy, not taking sides or anything like that. But that the strength of democracy is that we can hold in tension our differences, we can stick it out to the end, we can make decisions for the common good, and we can celebrate the depth of our community. There are things that we can do as citizens, but mainly as faithful Christians, to march forward in this challenging time of our lives. May we persevere as God has called us to. May we always seek to find the joy of Jesus all around us. And the rejoicing of creation in that which surrounds us. For God is with us. Whether we are celebrating a certain victory or depressed about a certain defeat, God is with us and encouraging again and again to do what is for the common good and to be instruments of peace and love in this world. Amen.
be our newly elected leader, and of all the nations, in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for Mark, Warren, Madeline Lodges, Helen Emery, Todd James, Tom Spector, and their families, and all deployed in harm's way. We also give thanks for all veterans who have served with fidelity and courage to protect this nation, our freedoms, values, and way of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Shannon, Susan, and Ted, our diocesan bishops, Ben, our rector, Randolph and Lynn, our associates, Jeff and Selvin, our seminarians. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Those for whom our prayers have been asked include Larry, Jody, Lynn, Paul, Lindsay, Mary, Janet, Kevin, Francis, Dudley, Iris, Marissa, and Anne. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We commend to your mercy all those who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church. And give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. So I was out of the office for the second half of the week in, um, in actually New Orleans for the first time for a very uplifting conference. One of the most positive uh, and collaborative parts of the Episcopal Church, one of the uh, most uh, green and growing parts of the Episcopal Church are our schools. And this was a National Association of Episcopal Schools conference. Uh, and it was inspiring to see around the country uh, the difference that the schools are making in their local communities, uh, in the young people, uh, and in those that are uh, affected by it, and in the parishes. 
Uh, and it was great to see uh, how the work that we do here is mirrored in other places. Uh, and uh, while we were having the closing worship, with you, if you remember the Escameras, uh, the high school students at their school uh, down in Baton Rouge were leading the closing worship. Uh, and at the same time, our youth chorale were singing at a nursery home to veterans, uh, celebrating uh, Veterans Day. And it was beautiful to see uh, all of uh, these gifts being offered uh, to God's glory and to God's people. Uh, so it was wonderful, uh, wonderful to be part of that. Uh, and I thank Randolph and all the work that he did this week to make it possible for me to be away and everyone else. Uh, and then I come back and our choir is offering their gifts uh, at, at, at an inspiring uh, a unifying service down in the southern part of our county in Bealton uh, with True Deliverance Ministries, St. Patrick's Orthodox Church and several, Bealton Baptist Church and several other communities uh, that came together uh, to celebrate, one, what we have to be thankful for, uh, to celebrate the things that bind us together. Uh, one of the most moving moments was uh, an elderly gentleman at the end uh, had his hand raised uh, and, and waited forever for someone to notice his hand raised and he said, could you all sing Amazing Grace for me? And every choir uh, was gathered, and we all stood and sang together Amazing Grace. Uh, and I thought it encapsulated what, what Randolph talked about this morning, uh, of what this world desperately needs, uh, that uh, together we can heal uh, all the things that are broken, but uh, we need to be together. Uh, so it was wonderful to be part of. So thanks to the choir for inspiring me yesterday. Uh, thanks for all the people associated with the schools that inspire me. Uh, but that's just a little bit about what's going on in the life uh, of, of, of the church and school. Uh, this coming Wednesday, we will have a combined church and school uh, service. So this is a two-part announcement. Those of you who come to the noon service, it won't take place. Uh, but we encourage you to come to the 1 p.m. service, uh, which will be church and school and a Thanksgiving celebration. Uh, and then this coming Saturday is our big fundraiser for our Learning Starts Early initiative. Uh, uh, Tyrone uh, and Felicia Champion's uh, new uh, preschool that is serving the southern part of the county uh, will be the recipient of, of a lot of our proceeds. Uh, but if you haven't signed up, please do so. Sign up to run, sign up to walk, sign up to wobble, sign up to volunteer, sign up just to give a donation to an incredibly worthwhile cause, or just show up to see the energy around what's taking place. Uh, also, uh, check out Spirit Night on Thursday. Um, and then if you flip to the back, uh, the second announcement I want to bring your attention to, Food for Friends. This is the ninth annual Bread Bake. Uh, the Borgstroms have carried this tradition uh, through three different uh, clergy, and it is a wonderful tradition. Uh, we're looking to make 800 loaves of bread. If you can part with any part of your Friday, this coming Friday, to be there, whether it's in the morning or lunchtime or right after lunch, uh, to help with the bread baking. It's a great community activity, uh, and it, it's just a worthwhile uh, use of your time. Uh, and they're more than willing to write notes to students uh, that this is a service project, and so anybody who's getting out of a little bit of school uh, can come and do that as well. Uh, and then the last announcement, I'm going to have Laura come and talk a little bit about our uh, angel project going on right now. Hi. Sorry, I had a little shadow today. We were sick this week. It seems <laughs> we're in that one of you with mommy face. Um, <laughs> so we are doing something, well, first, actually, I should say I have one sort of the housekeeping announcement, which is that... Um, Caitlin, who has been in our nursery, those of you with young children know her, is a young 20-something and decided to reclaim her Sunday mornings for a little while, which we can respect. But happily, we found somebody to take her place. Elizabeth Thirst will be starting on November 27. She's phenomenal. She was a nanny to two different families, and one of them had twins, so she's great at um, juggling kids. And she also has her own small children and is connected to the school through family and friends. So love St. James already, and I think she'll be a great fit. So Kathy is staying, and we have a new face. So you will be able to meet her on the 27th. Um, but so we are doing something a little bit different for our Christmas giving program. I know that in the past we've done the shoe boxes, but um, we were all very inspired by Madison's fifth grade service project, which was really directed towards children who often we're going into foster care. I mean, these are kids who are kind of ripped from their families and it's a very traumatic experience for them. And, um, and Madison's project started that idea of making, picking 
our time and our effort in really working to make this group of children's lives better at a time when they just need it. So instead of the shoe boxes that we sent abroad, this year we are doing an angel tree. Um, and the way this works, it's not, some of you might have done it where it's kind of geared around families. This is a little bit different. We are, I mean, these children are not obviously with their families. Every once in a while you get siblings together, but quite frequently even siblings are split up and you end up totally isolated. Um, but in the parish hall, there is a beautiful angel that was designed by and created by Bonnie, for which we're incredibly grateful because nobody would want to see my angel attempt. Um, and uh, there are a bunch of tags on it. And on the tag is the child's name and then their age and then a list of presents that they have asked for. Um, and all that we ask is that you take one of the tags. At the very bottom, there's actually a number for the tag. This one is uh, 1653. There's also a clipboard. If you could just write on the clipboard which tag you took, that just means if you lose your tag, we have a record of it and we can make sure that everything gets to the right place and that we get all of the tags back. And we have, as a church, made a commitment to fulfilling all of the lists that we took. So we're hoping that you guys will help us with this. Uh, a couple of notes. Um, you do not have to buy every single thing on the tag but we are asking that the vast majority of items be purchased. And um, I will admit, especially for the older kids, I looked at a couple of the tags and was like, whoa. <laughs> but I just would like to, these are definitely children who are suffering. And we know many things about children in foster care. We know that they are at an incredibly increased risk for physical abuse and sexual abuse and verbal abuse. They are at an increased risk of dropping out of school. They are at an increased risk of teenage pregnancy. They are at an increased risk of drug abuse. But I absolutely guarantee you that they are not at an increased risk of being spoiled. So I feel like our job for this one day of the year is to help them feel a little spoiled. So if you have any questions, please do reach out to me um, or Nancy in the office. And there will be a second option. I haven't gotten it up. I wanted to try and get as many of the tags. For those of you who don't feel up to shopping or don't know what joggers are when a 17-year-old boy asks for them, um, there is uh, several of the students, particularly the 17 and 18-year-olds who are about to age out and will be completely independent, did actually ask for um, gift cards, including, rather sadly, I thought grocery gift cards. So these are often not children asking for play toys. These are like, I, oh my gosh, I need to survive on my own in a year. Um, so I will have a list of gift cards, and if it's easier for you and you just want to buy the gift card and bring those in, you can do that, and then I will make sure they get to the right child. So we have until December 4th. We have to turn them all over on December 5th. Please um, help a child have a happy Christmas. Thank you.
service continues with Eucharistic Prayer A, beginning on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and fit on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
thanksgiving, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. You have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. As you have been fed at this table, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from Creator, Son, and Spirit, Go with you. Amen. to love and serve the Lord. 